thank you everyone for joining us um, nice and bright and early in the morning. Uh, my name is Caitlin and I'm a health technology advisor with the doctor's technology office. And today we will be giving you a live demo of a patient visit workflow using Zoom for healthcare. So today we have our fabulous presenter, Holly Choi, who will be going through um, about a 30 minute demo um, working through sort of the basic steps of using Zoom for healthcare. So she'll be showing you how to invite visits to, how to invite, sorry, patients to a visit, how to manage your virtual waiting room, and how to start, conduct, and end your um, patient visits using the most efficient workflows. With us today, we also have some panelists. Um, so we're very lucky to have Dr. Eric Kadesky on the line with us, as well as his 55-day-old um, co-presenter. <laughs> Um, we also have Agata Watsinka, Watsinka, who is our uh, virtual care specialist at Doctors Technology Office. Um, so just letting you know, this will run for an hour. We will end at 8 o'clock, but the presenters will stay on the line for a couple minutes if you do have any questions. I um, just want to say this is really focused on Zoom for Healthcare workflows. So if you have other questions that are a little more generic to virtual care, please feel free to ask those. Uh, but we might follow up with you after um, this session. Also, just want to let everyone know that um, at least for the next little bit, Holly will be available for one-on-one -on -one training sessions for you and a group of physicians or MOAs um, or other staff that support you. Um, so if you feel like after this webinar, you'd still like a little more one-on-one -on -one time, Holly is available. So please just reach out to us after the webinar and we can get that um, scheduled with you. Also just wanna let everyone know that we plan on running um, a second demo session in a couple of weeks and it will be focused um, on an MOA audience and more on MOA workflows, so stay tuned for that. Um, and now I'll pass it over to you, Asher, to go with the housekeeping. Thank you, good morning, everybody. Yeah, so I just wanna um, cover a couple of housekeeping items here. Um, Anshel, if you could just go to the next slide, please. Um, so as you're aware, when you, si when you sign into the session, you're all put automatically in listen-only mode. But of course, we still want you to join the conversation, ask questions, make any comments. Um, so there's a couple of ways of doing that. If you move your cursor to the bottom of the screen, um, the, the toolbar will show up with all the different options. Um, so when you, when you do click raise hand, um, I will take you off, mu off mute so that you can speak. Um, but you can also, if you're not comfortable speaking, um, there's the Q&A box. Um, so you can enter your question in there or any comments you would like to make. Um, and those are actually getting recorded. So if we don't get to your question that you typed in, we can still follow up with you after the session. And there's always also an upvote button. So when you see those questions come in on your end as well, you can actually upvote them if it's something that speaks to you that you totally agree with. And that way we can tell that there is interest for multiple, multiple physicians on that um, particular item. And last but not least, there is the chat box. And that one, if you use that one um, for any for any technical issues, then I will touch base with you and try and sort it out with you. And then over to you, Holly. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Holly. Um, I'm here today to walk you through the workflow of a patient visit using Zoom for Healthcare. And I really want to get across how smooth and easy this process can be. Um, it is really quite an amazing tool. And while there are some limitations that are in place, um, it's really something that you can use to continue to make your workflow really near what it was like before, just instead of seeing your patient physically in front of you, they're over video. And um, I really, really hope that by the end of the session, you feel a little bit more confident. And I'm going to just mute myself and cough because I'm losing my voice already. <laughs> there, that should be better. And um, I, I really want you to feel confident with this. Again, like Caitlin said before, I am available for support as well on one-on-one -on -one, so that if you feel like you just want someone to meet you where you're at, we can do that too. But the goal for today is to show you how smooth this process can be when you're using it in your clinic. So what I'm going to be doing is sharing my screen. And this might look a little confusing at first, but I'm going to be showing you my computer screen, um, showing a Zoom meeting. Right now we're in a webinar, so you're going to see the process as if we 
were to start from scratch, just loading up our computer in the morning. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. So here we go. Okay. So the idea of the Zoom workflow is that we're going to start off by getting the patients <laughs> invited. And really the beauty of this workflow is that all that's really going to change is that the patients just at some point need to be sent a link. And I know in the beginning when the Zoom technology was presented as a virtual care option, there was a lot of different messages out there. And the workflow that we've put together is to really simplify this to make it very, very easy, both for you and for your staff, so that this process can be done very simply and not be an additional burden. Now, um, in order to do that, um, I just want to talk briefly about the PHSA settings um, for Zoom for Healthcare. One of the things that is really, really important to note, I, there was so much concern around security. And I just have to very strongly emphasize that if you are using the PHA license for Zoom for Healthcare, that the waiting room feature is enabled on and it cannot be turned off. So there were a lot of concerns in the beginning around Zoom bombing, if you heard that term, of people maybe being able to jump into a meeting um, if they had the link. The way that the PHSA Zoom for Healthcare license is set up is that that waiting room cannot be turned off. So the way that we like to describe it is imagine that your waiting room is your clinic door. You can only let people into a meeting if you actually let them in yourself they can't jump in while you're in the middle of a visit with another patient. So I just really wanna strongly emphasize that you have full control of who will be joining your meeting at all times. So that being said, um, and another quick security note is please um, make sure that if you're using your Zoom for Healthcare account that that is used just for your clinical visits so that we're not mixing it up with personal items as well. But um, we very strongly recommend downloading the Zoom client if you haven't already and installing it onto your machine. Now, the machine that you're looking at right now is a Mac, but it, this will look the same whether you're using it on a Mac or PC. And um, in the morning when you open up your Zoom app, you should see a window that looks like this. And if you don't see this window, just take a quick look at the top of the screen and you should see a number of icons. So you'll see here it says, home, chat, meetings, contacts. Right now I'm on the home tab. So you'll see that there are different options in here. So the first thing that I want you to do is when you open up your Zoom app in the morning, just take a quick peek over on the right hand side. And you can see here I have my profile picture. But if I click on that, what I can see here is that it says licensed and it shows me the email address that is licensed and it is super important that you just double check you're logged into your account that has your PHSA Zoom license associated with it. So if you see an email address different from the one that you signed up for your account with, you may be logged into another personal account and you want to make sure that you're in the correct one. So just always quickly do a double check there. Another little side note and something that I'll bring up again in a few minutes is you'll notice here that it shows my name, Holly Choi. Um, that's what other people are going to see as well when they're in a meeting with me. And um, when you're setting up your waiting room in terms of the patients joining your waiting room uh, that day for their visit, they will see whatever name you have displayed here. And uh, a little tip is that you can edit this name to put the title doctor in your front name so that it's just a little more clear who they're connecting with. Um, and I'll show you where that would show up in a few minutes. I'll show you what the waiting room looks like. But as long as you're logged into your Zoom for Healthcare account, then what we propose for a workflow is using something called your personal meeting ID. And that's something that is built into Zoom. It's very easy to set up. And your personal meeting ID is one consistent link that we can give out to multiple people. So the beauty of this workflow is we're not individually scheduling meetings for each patient. That would be very time consuming and difficult to keep track of the links. What we're going to be doing is giving them one link. Every patient would get this link when they book an appointment. And when it's their time to join, they will click on the link. Again, 
they can't jump into someone else's visit, don't worry about that, but everyone will get the same link. So the way that you get your link is once you're logged into your Zoom app, like I am here, you will notice that over on the left hand side, there is a big orange button that says new meeting and the orange button is really the only button that you're going to be using. To the right of the orange button, you'll see a little downward arrow. And if I click on that, it pops out a little menu. Um, there are two options here. And the one that you really need to make sure is always checked off is the second one that says use my personal meeting ID. What that's going to do is when we start our meetings, it will use that same meeting ID that we're giving out to patients so that that link that we're sending them will work correctly. Now, typically once you check off that box on one computer or one device, it will usually stay checked. So you don't usually have to do that every single time. Um, but if you do update your Zoom app or your computer, or you switch to a different machine, there is a chance that that box may not be checked. So it's a good idea to just do a quick double check in the morning and make sure that that box still has a tick in it. Now, the number below where it says use my personal meeting ID, that number is my personal meeting ID and that is set by Zoom. And if I hover over that number, you will see an option that says copy invitation. And what that's going to do is copy that link that we're going to give to the patients to my computer's clipboard. So I'm going to press copy invitation. And that's just to give you an idea of what happened there. It copied it to my clipboard. If I just open up a text document for a moment to show you, if I were to paste this into the text document, this is what it placed on my clipboard. And you'll see that there is a link in here this is the link that needs to go to the patient. They don't need all the other information and the advice here is really, you know, you can personalize your invitation as best you see fit. And if you need some help with that, the DTO does have resources for helping you, you know, if you need help with a template or anything like that, we can absolutely help you. But the idea is that you could craft your own clinic email of, here's the link to your appointment, please join 10 minutes ahead of time, um, when the doctor is ready to see you, they will admit you into the room. Thank you for your patience. And then maybe something at the bottom saying, you know, this email is not monitored, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where you'll get that link. So just to recap that, I clicked on the downward arrow next to the new meeting button, hovered over my personal meeting ID number and pressed copy invitation. So that's how I got that link. So that link really, once you've got that link, your MOA can take that and they can send it out to the patients and however you see fit, most clinics have been using email to do that, but that is the easiest way to get your link that you can send out to patients. So the idea is every time the MOA is booking an appointment, they would continue to use whatever you are currently using to book appointments, be that an online scheduler or in your EMR directly, and they would then send that link out to the patients once they've booked the appointment. So once the patients have the appointment, this is where we would get into actually starting the visit. So um, in a few moments here, we're going to have uh, our patient Nicholas joining us, but I'm going to show you how to start your visit. So again, let's say it's first thing in the morning, I walked into the clinic, I'm ready to start my um, visits for the day. You're going to open up Zoom. You're gonna see that orange button. You're just going to double check. You've got that use my personal meeting ID check checked off. And then you're going to press new meeting. And that's going to start a meeting using your personal meeting ID. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that. Okay, now I have to switch my video over to the other side in a moment here. When you open up Zoom, first thing in the morning, you will often see a little pop-up that says join with computer audio, and we recommend doing that. It is possible to call in using your phone. The sound quality can just be a little bit compromised sometimes when you do that. So if you have a good internet connection, we do recommend using join with computer audio. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm just going to mute myself so that we don't get feedback. 
So now I'm just going to switch my camera over. Okay. So this is what you would see in the morning. So you would be able to turn on your video by hovering down in the bottom left corner over the stop video button and that will toggle your video on and off. Now I'm in the meeting by myself right now. There's no patients in here yet, but once you've got your meeting open, I like to think of it as opening your clinic door. At this point now, patients can enter your clinic, they can join your waiting room, but they're not actually coming into the exam room until you let them in. So now that I'm in here, in order for me to see that waiting room and see what's going on, at the bottom of the screen, there is a participants icon and that will bring up the panel on the right hand side where you can see the participants. And right now I'm only seeing my name. So that means I don't have any patients in my waiting room yet. And the other button that can sometimes be helpful is down in the bottom, there's a button called chat that will open up also on the right hand side, a chat panel. And here I can enter messages. You can message directly um, to someone that you are currently in the room with. You can also message out to the waiting room and I'll show you that in a moment. So we'll uh, give Nicholas a moment to join our waiting room here. While you are set up in, uh, in your view, this is a great opportunity to make sure that your audio is working. So make sure that your microphone's working, that your camera is set up, that your lighting is good. I am wearing a headset right now and I really strongly recommend using a headset whenever possible because if you are shuffling papers or anything around, it can help to reduce that noise that's coming over the microphone. Okay, so now I see that Nicholas is in our waiting room. So if you look in the top right of the screen, you will see that it says one waiting. And that means that Nicholas has clicked on that link. So that link that I showed you earlier that we copied to our clipboard and that our MOA would email off um, to the patient, Nicholas has now clicked my personal meeting ID link and he is now in my waiting room. So he's not in the meeting with me yet and I can let him in when I'm ready for him. What I wanna show you before I let Nicholas in is what I would see if I were a patient waiting for the doctor. So I'll just pull up a screenshot on my computer here. This is what the patient would see on their end. So it's a screen that will say the meeting host will let you in soon. And then you can see below that it says Holly Choi's personal meeting room. So if you think back to earlier, I mentioned that it is possible to change your first name in Zoom um, to read, uh, you know, in this case, it could say Dr. Holly Choi you would have to modify that in your Zoom settings um, so that it's said that in front of your first name. They don't have a title field. You would actually have to change your first name in this case to Dr. Holly. But I do find um, that that can be just a little bit of additional clarity that you can give your patients so that they feel confident that they're in the right place. So before I let Nicholas into the visit, I can send messages out to the waiting room while I am in my visit here. So if you find that you're running a few minutes behind and you wanna just let people know and thank them for their patience, by turning on that chat panel, so we did that with that chat button at the bottom, I can come over to the right-hand side and you'll see that it says two, and that right now it currently says everyone, but if I click on that, there are some different options. So I can click uh, everyone in meeting, which is what is currently highlighted, or I can chat to everyone in the waiting room. You can't single out individual patients and send them an individual message, but you can send out a one-way blast. So I could say, thank you for your patience. I'll be with you shortly. And that would go out to the waiting room. So now on Nicholas's device, he sees that message. It is a one-way message, they can't message you back, but if you do wanna just blast a message out to the waiting room, it is absolutely possible to do that. Okay, so let's talk about the flow of getting patients in and out of the visit. So now that I'm in the visit, I've got my camera ready, I'm ready to start my first visit. I can check over on the right-hand side, I see my participants panel and I see, oops, 
there we go. Um, and I can see that I've got Nicholas over in the waiting area. So to admit Nicholas into the waiting room, I am simply just going to hover over him and press admit. So we will uh, open this up to Nicholas. So at that point, he's then going to pop into our meeting. Good morning, Nicholas. Can you hear me okay? Oh, there we go. You can hear me? Perfect. All right, so now that Nicholas is in the meeting, this is really just going to be like a typical visit. And yes, Nicholas isn't physically in front of me, but we can have that conversation. And it's good to always just ensure that the patient is in a safe location, quickly double check in with them, you know, make sure that if there is anyone else nearby that they feel comfortable in the space that they're talking in. Now, um, while I've got Nicholas in the visit, there are a lot of different things that I can do um, in this screen. Um, one is that I can share with him um, on screen sharing. So I'll pop some windows open on my computer here for a moment. So I can share my screen with him if I wanted to show him a website or a video, or even if I wanted to show him his test results. To do that, I would go down to the bottom um, menu bar here and click on the share screen button. And what it will show you in this view is any windows that you currently have open on your computer. So if they're minimized, they won't show, but if they are open, you will see them. Um, and so from here, you can show your whole desktop, which is very much like what I'm showing you right now. You can see my whole computer screen. However, if you have some sensitive information up on the screen, you may not want to share your whole computer screen or, you know, you could accidentally flash your patient chart, things like that. So the suggestion I have is when you press the share screen button, if you can single out an individual application, it is often safer to do so. And then you don't need to worry that they're going to see different pieces of your screen. So for example, if I wanted to share a website with Nicholas, I could click on my web browser only. And when I press share, it is only sharing this window with Nicholas. So he only sees this Zoom window that I have open in my web browser. So that is the, the share screen functionality. And again, <coughs> sorry, I'm gonna get my phone and cough here. Focal problems, there we go. Um, and so, yeah, this is um, what we would be using to, to share those results with our patients. Now, one of the things that I have learned from working one-on-one -on -one with, with physicians and helping them get used to using Zoom for healthcare is the ability to chart at the same time as having this patient call and that that can be one of the sort of hangups for them. And I really wanna emphasize, you don't need to use two devices. You can, if you prefer to have your Zoom call on an iPad and you wanna chart on your computer and have them separate, that's totally fine, but you don't have to do that. And if you only have one screen, it is definitely possible. So, sorry, I'm just gonna take a sip of water here. There we go. I know some of you know me personally and know I have a <laughs> reconstructed airway. So sometimes in the morning, my voice isn't very good. So I apologize for that. Okay. So if I want to chart at the same time that I'm having this video call with Nicholas, what I can do is, and um, again, I don't have um, a real chart on my computer, I will say, just, just to be clear. Um, but if I want to keep Nicholas's video, but see my chart at the same time, the easiest way to do that is to minimize my Zoom window. So at the top of your screen, I'm on a Mac right now, so it's this little yellow button, but it would be just your minimize button. So typically that's the one um, in the middle. So I'm just going to press the minimize button. And that puts Nicholas into this little bubble that I can now push around my screen. So in theory, you could have your chart open. Again, this is not a real chart, but you could have your chart open and then you can move your patient around. You can click and drag them around the screen. I can still see him. If I need to see him in more detail and I wanna go back and see him full screen, then I'm just hovering over this little exit minimal video button. So it's just gonna pop me back into my big screen. 
So the idea is that, you know, you could have your initial conversation with them, chart with them by minimizing the screen, and then bring them back into the full view to end the conversation. So it's a very, very smooth process. And um, it's, it's really been very, very helpful for the physicians that I've worked with to just be able to minimize that patient and see them off in the corner. Now, the one thing is that you don't see your own face when you're down there, right? So you have to be mindful of that. I'm very much a person who wears my emotions on my sleeve. So for me, um, I, I do see, have a lot of benefit in seeing myself so that I know that I'm not making a, a face at someone. But um, that's the one thing to be mindful of is I'm only going to see the patient down in the corner. And then when you come back to your regular view, again, you'll see yourself. Now, um, yes, Nicholas is the only patient in the call with me at the moment, but in theory, you can at this point have multiple people joining your waiting room and you're not limited to one-on-one -on -one calls. You can have multiple people and admit them into your visit um, at the same time. So if you wanted to have an entire family join you on a call, that is absolutely possible. You would give them all that same link they would all join the meeting room, or not the meeting room, the waiting room around the same time, and then you could admit them all into the call. So very easy to um, have larger groups in this um, at the same time if you, if you have any group visits that you do. Now, in terms of the management of patients, um, when I'm done with Nicholas, there's a few things that could happen. One is if Nicholas is savvy and he uses Zoom all the time and I tell him that the visit's over, he might just leave. Um, a lot of people will know how Zoom works and they might just leave themselves. But the challenge is that if you're trying to move between patients, you don't want to necessarily have someone fumbling around trying to figure out how to leave. And so there is a way to sort of kick them out the door so that you can let the next person in. So the way that we do that and Nicholas, I'll get you to stay in the waiting room for me just in case I need you. But um, I'm going to hover over Nicholas's name and I'm over the more button here when I click this, there's an option to put him back in the waiting room. And what that will do is it will put him back to where he started. He'll be out in the waiting room. He can't let himself back in, I have to do that. But it means that now he would be back in the waiting room and I could bring another patient in. So if I go ahead and put him back, that's, that's how you can put someone back. So if you need to even temporarily put someone in the waiting room and say, you know what, um, I'll come back to you in 15 minutes. I'm going to place you in the waiting room. Just hang out and I'll be back with you. You can also do that. So you can work between a few patients at a time if that's something that you think would be useful. Um, just to pull Nicholas back in for a moment here, the other option that was in that drop down, and I just want to touch on this quickly, there is an option to remove a patient. Um, it is possible to use that option as well, but it requires that you would change a setting first in your Zoom. So if you don't want to go in and change your settings and, and mess around with that, putting a patient in the waiting room is the easiest thing to do. I'm going to put you back in the waiting room. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, because at that point, you can just say to them, once you're back in the waiting room, go ahead and close the browser, go ahead and close the app, um, and the call will be over, and, and then you're done with that patient for the day. So it is a very, very smooth process to bring people in and out of the waiting room throughout the day. Now, here's the catch. Um, when we started our meeting, I told you that that new meeting button, that orange button that we press, it's kind of like opening your clinic door for the day. And once you start that new meeting, people can start to join your waiting room and they can pile up in there. The catch is it's super, super hard to, to resist this at first. So it's okay if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. But if you look at the bottom right corner of my screen, there is a red end button. If I press that button and I end the meeting, what it does is it's like closing your clinic doors. Anyone that was in your waiting room, they're now outside your waiting room. So if I hit the end button right now, what would happen is on Nicholas's end, he would see a message that say the meeting has ended and he might be a little bit confused. So the process is not actually to end your meeting after you're done with one patient, you would keep this open 
and your patients would pile up in the waiting room and you're really just moving people in and out of the waiting room. You're only going to press that red end button either at the end of your day when you're actually done seeing patients or if you had a few hours break in between and you know, you're not going to have people joining your waiting room in that time. But if people are going to be joining your waiting room, then I recommend leaving your meeting open. And again, no one can jump in or anything. You have to let them in. So you hold the keys to that door. So that is the process of the meeting. So at the end of the day, again, I would just go ahead and I would hit that end meeting button, end meeting for all. This would be closing my clinic door. I'm not seeing any more patients today. And that would end the meeting. Now, if you do that by accident and you're thinking to yourself, I really didn't want to do that. I meant to just put them back in the waiting room. I, oh, I wish I didn't mess that up. It's okay. You just hit new meeting again. It starts back up your meeting with your personal meeting ID. So it's not the end of the world if you do that, but um, it will sort of temporarily kick those people out of your waiting room. So. Worst case scenario, maybe they phone your MOA and say, hey, I just got a message that the meeting ended. Just get them to rejoin. Um, the same link will work. Everything will work the same. So it's not the end of the world if you make that mistake. But again, the recommendation is to only end the meeting at the end of the day, and then you'll have that nice smooth process. So um, I, <laughs> there really isn't much more to it. That is um, really all that you are looking at in terms of having um, a smooth workflow with Zoom. So this is where um, I would like to, I guess, uh, what should we do? Move into some Q&A, I would say, probably. Thanks so much, Holly. That was really helpful. Hopefully everyone else found it helpful. We do have the Q&A starting to pile up, which is great. Um, so we'll spend the next uh, rest of our time um, answering the Q&A and getting into that. So just to remind everybody, your Q&A box is at the bottom. Please enter your questions there. Also, you can raise your hand. We'd love to hear some of your voices. So if you'd rather ask your question live, um, just raise your hand and we can get you off mute and then um, you can actually speak and everyone can hear you. Um, I do just want to, while well, a couple things came to mind, I want to let everyone know, in case they don't know, um, DTO has created uh, quite a number of resources on uh, Zoom, so don't feel like this is all you get. Um, we do have Zoom Quick Start Guides for both physicians and patients, as well as a, um, an FAQ document. And then we also have three videos that Holly put together, um, all around how to conduct a group patient education session how to prepare for a visit, prepare um, basically all the things that Holly just showed, um, and then also how to conduct your virtual visit. So those are three separate videos, um, which also are, um, are available on our website and on our DTO YouTube page, if anybody's visited that yet. Um, but we will get those links out um, after the webinar. We'll send everyone an email and we'll include all of those, those links. Um, and then one other thing I was just, um, thinking is before we get into the specific Q&A, um, since we have Dr. Kadeski on the line, who is an avid Zoom user, um, I was wondering if you'd just be able to share a couple of maybe your tips and tricks um, and what you think has helped you be successful using Zoom on a patient visit. Uh, thank you. I think the biggest thing is just trying it. We know that when people have apps and different things like that, the majority of them never ever get used or opened. And so I had one of my colleagues who was wanting to schedule a meeting uh, with a few patients. And I said, well, have you actually tried? And she said, no. So I said, come over here and just, and just let's do it together and sit beside me. So I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? She said, well, I want to schedule a meeting. So I said, well, which button would you push? <laughs> so there's a schedule a meeting button. And so I think a lot of times this is so much about confidence. So even if you want to schedule something where you're talking to, you're going to set something up with someone in your family or a friend or one of your other email accounts, just taking a few moments and getting familiar with it is going to be helpful in the same way with anything else that you do. You know, we always practice 
uh, procedures on oranges uh, and mouse pads before we actually take it to human flesh. And so we, we want to visualize things, we want to practice things beforehand. And I do find this is so intuitive, but like anything else, we have to unwrap it, take it out of the box, uh, play with it a little bit. And honestly, within five to 15 minutes, you will be uh, as expert as anyone else on this call. Thank you so much. All right, we'll start working through the Q and A. It'll be kind of a mix of people who um, can respond. Um, so we're getting quite a few questions around sending invitations and emails and how to do that kind of properly or efficiently. So um, one question is around um, what is a good way to send your email invite out to your patients, but um, you don't want your patients to reply. So what are sort of some guidelines you would give if you kind of want a no reply um, email or um, in the cases where you don't want to maybe get, be giving out your, your clinic email, um, you want to use more of a generic um, email that your patients really won't be responding to. Is that for me? <laughs> okay, uh, I'll take a step back. So th there, there's a number of different ways. Um, the first one, in terms of if you if you don't want people to have your personal email, you can certainly set up a dummy email, an email account that's only for patient use. Uh, make sure it's on a relatively secure server. Make sure that you get consent, and you can add a, a footer. Uh, onto all of your emails in the same way that many of you have that when you send out an email on the bottom it has your academic credentials maybe some contact information on the bottom you can have something that says please do not this email the address is for information only uh, it does not accept uh, replies in the same way as i'm sure when you get things from uh, different companies sending you bills it says don't reply call this number for customer service so you can have that um, I know in other sessions we've talked about having burner uh, and sort of fake front uh, phone numbers. So you can do that with your, your email as well and then make sure that it does forward to the real email that you use uh, so that nothing slips through. It's just one fewer thing to, to check on. Uh, so that was, maybe that answers the question about uh, how to do the no reply. And maybe you do want replies. Maybe you do want people to be able to, to say, hey, are you gonna be open on Canada Day? Uh, personally, I found that I do uh, allow patients to email me and my average response is probably about five to ten seconds. Uh, usually the answers are things like yes, no, or I'll call you tomorrow. Uh, and with that, patients are really happy because they don't necessarily want resolution to their issue. They just want to know that you've heard it and that it's going to be dealt with. So, for example, Yesterday after five o'clock, I had three or four emails from patients. Um, didn't mean that I had to stop what I was doing or stop cooking dinner or cleaning up. It just meant I had to say, no, thank you for your question. I'll call you tomorrow. Or what's the earliest I can call you? So one of my patients is actually was available at 6.30 this morning. Uh, and so I was able to deal with her issue at 6.30, uh, which for me is, is a good time because that's around diaper change number three of the day. So it worked out well, whereas if I didn't have that, I might be waiting to try and connect with this person later on in the day. She's at work, she's commuting. And so this is a really quick way for me to understand and to get patient from patients when it is that they're available uh, and see where it overlaps. So that's some personal experience for me in terms of, I know we have concerns about having email open and patients flooding us with information, but my experience has been that they're very respectful and that usually the email is just for a quick triage and it's actually saved me a tremendous amount of time. Um, I also wanted to bring up, because I know we've got this question before about email templates. Um, so I will say in our Zoom quick start guide, we do have an example of a template that you could just copy and paste, um, customize it as much as you'd like to. Um, and that can be sent, that can be used to um, invite or send the invite link to your patients. Um, so just a heads up that if anybody is looking for an email template, we do have that and it's in the Zoom Quick Start Guide, which we will send out to you after the webinar. Uh, the, Zoom, the Zoom Guide is in PDF format, so we are going to also send a Word version of the, of the text so people can easily uh, import that into their own Word processing program at the clinic. Great. Okay, I know there's a um, couple, another question around invites. 
Um, so Holly, can you send the invite um, using a text message or SMS? Yes, you absolutely can. So provided that you have that set up um, somehow in your clinic to send out text messaging and you've got a system in place for that, yes, you can absolutely text the link and people can click on the link from their phone and join the meeting from their phone or whatever they receive that message on. So yes, that is absolutely a, a, an option. Great. Another question. So when patients are in the waiting room, is there anything in the waiting room that actually shows you how long the patient has been waiting for? At the moment, no, there is not anything that shows you that. So you would really be referencing your, um, I mean, if they show up early, they show up early, but you would be referencing your scheduler to see what their appointment time was and then taking the patients in theory in that order. Um, one question, and I know this was coming up quite a bit um, when virtual care started, is around equipment. And what are maybe some potential solutions if you have a computer that does not have a webcam? So that would be an opportunity where if you do have another device, um, such as a smartphone or an iPad or tablet of some sort, you can use Zoom on those. It's a little bit easier to do the process if you're doing it on a computer from the app, but I know that uh, over the last few months, it has been really difficult for some people to source a webcam even. So if you don't, you can use another device that has a built-in camera if you've got that available to you. Um, I do prefer personally to use Zoom on a computer. I find that it's just a lot easier to work through and um, use those settings and that flow is a bit easier, but it is possible to do it on an iPad, absolutely. And kind of related to that and devices, um, on the patient side, um, what does the patient need to do to get ready? So do they need to download an app? Can they just sign in on a web browser? Um, kind of what is required on the patient side? Yeah, so the patient um, can technically join from a web browser. It's possible. The experience, again, is always best if you're using an app. Um, Zoom will give them the option to download the app when they click on that link. Um, and if they prefer to join from a web browser, they can. Web browsers typically just have a little bit more limited functionality or can sometimes have a little bit of a delay in the audio and video um, aspect. But in terms of it working, totally works. App is great if they have it, but they don't need an app, they could join from a web browser. Great. Thank you. And um, for Dr. Kudeski, uh, we are getting questions around with your waiting room. Um, do you ever have it where people show up in the waiting room at the wrong time, or maybe they're in the waiting room and you weren't expecting them? And what do you kind of do in those situations? Yeah, so just like those would sort of be the equivalent of the walk-in. Uh, and so sometimes people will call my staff might say, oh, well, just, just go online and just like put the walk-in, you know, wait around and he'll, he'll get to you. And so in the same way that patients in the real world will, will have their smartphones with them, might watch some TV on their screen, most people are very happy to be doing other work while they're waiting. Uh, what I might do, especially if I already have their email I might send them a quick email and say oh hey I see you in the waiting room you know it looks like it might be about an hour feel free to come back then or just hang out or just do something else and I'll get to you uh, because one of the differences is whereas in the real world you might say look go go for a coffee and come back in an hour here they just basically keep that window open and they'll get that notification that I'm, I'm letting them in so they're doing whatever it is that they're normally doing whether it's it's being with their families or doing some other work and then they'll sort of hear that, that ding that notifies them that, that I'm ready for them. So I might give them a heads up. I also have a function through my EMR where I can send text messages to someone. So that's another option as well. And the best is, is obviously just setting those expectations. So if your staff are gonna have people sort of virtually walk in, let them know, hey, look, it's gonna be a little bit of a wait. Um, and so if, if, you're, if you're not seen or you need to leave, just, just go. And sometimes that'll happen in the same way. Sometimes people come into the, the real office during different times, come in, they're waiting. It's been half an hour. They've got another appointment. They were hoping just to pop in. It didn't work out. 
and they say, okay, I'll come back another time. So that'll happen as well. But again, the flow is very similar to, to what happens in the real world. And Holly, you were going over if you end the meeting and that unfortunately does kick out all of your patients in the waiting room. Um, when you restart your meeting, will the patients automatically be back in your waiting room or do they need to rejoin? They will most likely need to rejoin. And again, not the end of the world. They can click the same link. Um, personally, if that happened to me as a patient, I would probably just try clicking the same link. But worst case scenario, you know, they may phone the office number and get the MOA and they'll say, sorry, <laughs> click on the link. It should work again. So absolute worst case scenario, all they need to do is re-click on it. But yeah, they probably will need to rejoin. And we are getting questions, um, some related to the functionality of Zoom. So there's been a couple of questions around sharing files and sharing patient photos or being able to exchange files between um, the provider and the patient. Um, so just wanted to say, so if you are using the PHSA um, version of Zoom for Healthcare, they have, at least at this time, disabled the file transfer option. Um, that's mainly just for security reasons. Uh, but they are going through a uh, privacy and security assessment right now to look at some of those features that have been disabled, at least right now. Um, so there is potential that the file transfer will be enabled at some point. But if you are using the PHSA version, just to let you know that file transfer is disabled at this time. Um, but we do know there are lots of different versions. So there are versions through RCCPD um, as well through the different health authorities. And you have slight configurations. So um, you just depend on which version you are using. Um, and you can always check with your specific, um, whoever provided you the, the instance of Zoom, you can always check with them um, or reach out to DTO and we can do a bit of digging for you if you're curious about your particular. Okay. And Caitlin, we actually have one hand raised here. Um, Ken, I'm just going to take you off mute if you want to go ahead. Good morning, Holly. You did Good a great morning. job. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, one of the things that I noticed uh, or that I, I would like to uh, uh, ask if DTO has or if they know a link to it is um, some advice to physicians about how to present themselves um, appropriately on Zoom. Um, so sometimes you have like the ceiling light on behind you and it sort of gives you a bit of a glow or something like that. And sometimes, you know, um, you have the camera or something looking down or it's lower and you get to see, you know, uh, your the lower part of your nose or something like that. I mean, there are, um, because it's becoming such a uh, a common used uh, virtual media that we need to go ahead and uh, and uh, teach our members um, or instruct them, train them how to use it in a, in an appropriate way. Um, I got Agatha. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe I will jump in on Agatha uh, and Victor, a specialist for DTO. Uh, yes, we we have some advice in our quick guide for uh, Zoom healthcare users for physicians and MOAs, but we don't have a specific document. And I think it's a good idea right now when we time is a little bit slower for us. We we definitely can develop one. Thank you, Dr. Benz, for mentioning that. And we definitely can probably provide some help like this. My we son, who is, uh, who is a lawyer, and they're using Zoom a lot, uh, sent me uh, a, uh, a video clip, or it's, I think, about four minutes. And it, and it shows the contrast between doing this and doing that. And uh, it does make quite a bit of a difference in the presentation if you, you do it properly. So uh, that would be a, a valued asset i think awesome i will reach out to you dr best with your permission and we will follow up and use as many resources as possible to help our doctors thank you you're welcome so another question again around invites um how do you navigate it if your patients do not have an email how do you send them the invite or let them know how to join their, their Zoom um, meeting or give them the, the meeting ID? That's a challenge. So if they don't have something, they have to be able to click on it somehow. So 
Um, it is technically possible to make a link on a website somewhere. For security reasons, some people argue that that might not be the best thing to do to put that link out there because then anyone could click on it and you may get a bunch of people joining your waiting room that you're not expecting. Um, again, they can't get into your meeting, so you still have that control, but that could be one solution. Um, but at the end of the day, they do need to get the link somehow. So if it's not via email, perhaps even um, a family member's email or if possible, SMS, those are really the, the options, but they have to be able to click on it is what it, what it really boils down to. We also see uh, from our conversations with physicians, we also see that it becomes more popular to uh, pair uh, patients with family members, friends, neighbors that are trusted to walk them through the appointment and help them with the technical side of it. So uh, it is possible um, to have some volunteers and have some allies at the side of the patient to help and they can probably provide uh, the computer and, and email access with the link. That might be one option for vulnerable patients. Have another hand up um, from Dr. Monk. We can take her off mute. Okay, go ahead. I unmuted you. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to point out why am I having an echo? Can you hear me? No. Yes. Just wanted to point out that if people want to put their Oh, well, now you're going really faint and we can't hear you anymore. So you can't hear me anymore? No, you're very, very okay. far away now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay, so I want to point out that if patients want to, or if doctors want to post their online waiting room link, are you hearing reverb? No. 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 If patients want to, if doctors want to post their online waiting room link, they can post it on in the Pathways Virtual Care Directory. Then all the patient has to do is click into it at the time of the meeting. And many doctors have post their online waiting room links. And even if a random person drops into the waiting room, as you pointed out, you have no obligation to respond to random people who drop into your waiting room. And it's just so much easier to just tell people, click in, go to the Pathways Virtual Care Directory, find my waiting room link there, and click into it at the time of your appointment. It's so easy. And if you take a look at the virtual Pathways Virtual Care Directory, which we now have two, over 2,000 doctors in, not everyone has taken advantage of that opportunity to uh, include their online waiting room, and it will simplify their workflow, I think, to not get enmeshed with the email stuff and just put the link there. Great, thank you so much. And if they forgot to add it, they're at the bottom of their listing in the Pathways Virtual Care Directory, there's a little button that says, click here to add something to your listing. And then you could just say, please add this as my online waiting room link to my existing listing. Great, and we can definitely include the information around the um, virtual care director when we send out the um, email after the webinar so that everyone knows how they can get listed on there and include their information. Yeah. And just to confirm with you, Dr. Monk, um, this is something that patients can easily access, correct? Yeah. If you want, I could do a screen share and show you what I'm talking about. We can, I, how about we wait um, at eight o'clock um, and then if people are around and that's what they wanna see, then definitely we'd love to see that. Sure, yeah. Thanks. And we do have a couple people who have requested to book one-on-one -on -one time with you, Holly, so that's great. So yes, anybody who would like that, please just post in the, the Q&A and we can follow up with you with the, the link to get that um, scheduled. And with a couple of minutes left, we have another hand up. Um, we can get um, Dr. Sahota off mute.
Okay, you need to unmute yourself on your end as well. I've unmuted you on our end, so you should see a pop-up mess message on your end saying that you agree to unmute. Uh, All right. Maybe we just need to move on considering we only have a few more minutes left. Perfect. Yeah, and if Dr. Soda, if you're able to unmute yourself, then we'll definitely get to you. Um, yeah, there's still a bunch of questions. We just have a few left. Um, there is a comment around registration. So if you um, submitted your application, um, this is in reference to the PHSA version or any of the other health authority versions, um, but you potentially didn't get your registration email um, or it's not working or whatnot, um, please just reach out to DTO and we can work on figuring out kind of where the glitch in the system might be. Um, so yes, if you want to Zoom but you haven't got your activation email, please reach out and we can make sure that the copy of that gets um, sent to you. Um, one question um, is around if you how how can you make sure that you're on the right version of Zoom? So we know a lot of people do have a personal version as well as a professional version, such as their Zoom for healthcare version. Um, and we do know that sometimes you think you're signed into one, but you're actually signed into the other one. So what is Holly a quick way to check which version you're signed into? Okay, let's see. Oh, hold on, let's see if I can get that going again. When you are in your Zoom account. Um, in your in your application itself. Let's see if this will pop up. Hmm, sorry, my screen share is not working anymore. Um, you can you can go into your zoom settings. So for me, that just is going into my um, about zoom under the um, menu. And it tells me that I'm currently using version 5.1.0. So um, that will actually I wonder if I can take a screenshot and show you on this computer, actually. Yeah, so I'll take a quick screenshot and show you what that looks like. Uh, what I heard is waiting. One practical way is to make a difference within how you name uh, yourself in the room. So your clinic room can be your doctor such and such name and your private can be your more less formal uh, name and then you can quickly say which one you are in. Mm -hmm. So in your in your zoom app it will also show you um, that what your version is and that if you go to the about zoom in your zoom app. So here I can see on my on this computer I happen to have 5.02 on my other one I have 5.1. Um, the current, as long as you are in version five, is the most important. That was the most important, most recent security update. So version five onward is what we should be using at this point. And they did kind of force that update. So if you're using Zoom, you should be on version five. Great. Thank you so much. So it is eight o'clock. Um, so we will end things now. Um, yes, there will be a recording. Um, so this is recorded. You can go back and watch it. Um, like I said, we will send an email with all of the links. Um, and just to give you a heads up, because we haven't mentioned it yet, when you um, close, there will be an evaluation survey. Um, three quick questions. So please, please um, fill it out. We always love to get your feedback. Um, Holly is available one-on-one, -on -one, as we said, so please write into the Q&A or email dtoinfo at doctorsofbc.ca and we will get you scheduled with Holly. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Dr. Kadeski and Baby for joining us today um, and hope everyone has a great day. We will keep it open so we'll kind of, um, everyone can sign out, but we will stick around for a couple more minutes if people do want to um, have a few last minute questions. But otherwise, thank you for joining us.